side. We're going to jump straight back um, to the Atlantic and uh, talk about uh, Hibernia. For that, let me start the slides here for uh, uh, Bjarni Fuhrmarsson, who is the CEO of Hibernia. So, Bjarni, off to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, first, before I tell you about Hibernia or, <coughs> or myself, where I come from, Richard, you mentioned uh, before your talk that the difference between this panel and the one that preceded us was that they were talking about broad chapters and, and we were very focused on, on, very, on a very narrow, uh, specific subject, right? And that reminded me of the story of, of the progression of, of education as you go from um, high school to uh, college to university or from bachelor degree to master's and PhD. You really, it's all about... Um, specializing and learning more and more and focusing and learning more and more about less and less. Until I think PhD you know everything about nothing. <laughs> I, that's just probably what you were talking about here, right? Um, um, so I'm Bjarni Thorson. I'm uh, CEO of Hydro Atlantic. We are focused on, as the, uh, as, as the name would give, give away, um, capacity in the Atlantic. I would I've been with the parent company of Hibernia Atlantic for about seven years, which is Columbia Ventures, or CBC. We acquired this asset from uh, the same company as, as Eric's uh, um, company, Welcome 360, uh, 360 Atlantic and 360 America. And we've been operating it uh, ever since. If you, if you want to learn more, and I, I hope, um, during the day here, uh, I'm accompanied by three of my colleagues, uh, Mike Saunders, Eric Gutschel, and, and Joe Hill. I'd be happy to uh, tell you much more about that, uh, our company and that asset. If, if, yeah, uh, if we talk about capacity in the Atlantic, <coughs> and if this slide looks familiar, uh, it's because you saw it 10 minutes ago. Richard Elliott uh, gave you the same statistic. Uh, it's good that uh, great minds think alike, and, and also you and me. Uh, <laughs> it, we have we have or had at the end of last year had about 25% uh, utilization, if you can call it that, in the Atlantic. Um, and that is up from 2002, about 5% or so. In, uh, in 2002, when, when I started, uh, we started uh, looking at this market, it was very, very distressed, uh, low capacity, and people said it's never going to fill up. But with, uh, with the market growing at 40% percent give or take a year, even taking into account the added capacity that, that can be put into the existing cables, we are now up to 25 or 30 percent utilization. And um, if you go into the next one, but that means that we still have 70 percent to go. So in the transatlantic market, there's uh, there's not much activity in terms of builds or new cables. Uh, the the uh, the builds that are going on are geographically focused or they're focused on, on reducing latencies on certain routes. And I have uh, put up five uh, current projects or, or announced projects. <coughs> One is a, a cable from I between Iceland and Denmark, uh, which is to enable data center business up in Iceland. Uh, Iceland only had one, one cable to, uh, to anywhere. If we, if we discount the Canta 3, which probably will be taken out of service soon, I needed another one. So that was down Iceland. Second one is uh, Greenland needed connectivity, wanted connectivity to go anywhere, was relying on, on satellite communication, so <coughs> built a, a submarine cable from Greenland to Iceland and from Greenland to Canada. Third one is similar, similar to Green, uh, Danice, is a cable that we have announced, Hibernia Atlantic announced between um, Iceland and Ireland, and that's a project that we have ready and, and will uh, pull off the shelf when uh, data center business in Iceland calls for it. Um, fourth one is a project that Hibernia Atlantic is working on right now, which is a 30 million euro project sponsored by the European Union or Interreg um, to build a spur from our Northern Cable into Northern Ireland and, and uh, therefore enhancing connectivity between Northern Ireland or the island of Ireland into, into US or into Canada. And, and the fifth one is a project that we undertook to shorten, shorten latency between Amsterdam and, and North America by uh, introducing a new uh, London bypass route. These, these 
are the these are the projects that are are going on in the Atlantic now. Um, none of them raise or address or, or give additional generic capacity between, say, London and New York, which is which are the two biggest markets. So uh, the question is, what what is what's likely to happen there? Are, are we likely to see new cables being built anytime soon? And uh, attached to that question is, what do you expect from pricing? Uh, can you it, are current cables going to go up, or can anyone uh, justify building new cables? Now, we, I already said that total capacity is uh, of the total theoretical or, or, or maximum capacity in the Atlantic, about 30% has been <coughs> that is being used today. Uh, with, with the growth, and I'm sure uh, telegeography, this is a, a figure taken from tele, telegeography, there are a few people from there, uh, from them here today, they can. Uh, confirm that the market is growing about 45, 40 to 50 percent a year. So a simple math uh, would uh, would mean that a market that is 30 percent filled today is going to fill up very soon. Go from 30 to 45 to 70. So it's it's going to fill up in the next few years. And the the progression or the additional capacity that we can put on, on existing cables is is growing nowhere close to or 40 or 50 percent a year. It's growing, and so we can put additional 10G waves, uh, more and more 10G waves on the current cables, it's not uh, going to keep up with the growth in demand. So a simple math or, or uh, sanity check will, will tell us that in the next few years, we will need new cables. Same math will also tell us that uh, at current <coughs> pricing, be that uh, 13,000 or 15,000, uh, pick a number, a wave, a 10 G wave, not London to New York. You're never going to justify a 400 to 500 million dollar investment in a new system. So we'll have to see a new paradigm, price paradigm, before uh, any CFO, be that for a, a private investor or a an incumbent, will say yes to a to participation to a participation in a new system. That's it. Thanks, Bernie. I, I just wanted to add. Um, for all of you that are not in the submarine world, a couple of data points. So you have a, an idea of uh, the, the complexity of building these systems. Uh, our system, which was built more or less at the same time that Hibernus was built, um, costs in the order of $1.2 billion. So there's it's an awful lot of capex um, to put it in. It takes about a year or so of planning, and it takes about a year and a half for you to deploy a new system. And when you start looking at these type of figures, you have to almost do the reverse calculation and say, look, if we're going to run out of capacity in, in 2015, then when do we need to start thinking about some of them? And how are we going to recover that huge amount of money that we need to put up front? Because the developing world has been slowly picking up, you're going to hear throughout our sessions that there's other systems that are coming up in the rest of the world. And because of the downturn that happened in the 2000 to 1001 time frame, a lot of the factories, primarily Alcatel, Tyco,